I've been seeing on social media a lot these days, these past few days, um, a lot of quotations are being posted, um, a lot of memes, uh, photos with, uh, with quotations um, on top of the photos are making the rounds. And one that stands out to me uh, that I've seen is attributed to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, although it's worth noting that when he said it, uh, he did say it, but when he said it, he was actually quoting a letter from a group of fellow clergy. And the quotation is, there comes a time when silence is betrayal. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. Oh, Pleasant Hill, you don't really know me yet. And I don't know you. At most, you've seen me preach uh, four online sermons. You've maybe read a handful of letters uh, that I send in our weekly church newsletter that goes out on email. I'm getting to know you, slowly but steadily. It's hard during this pandemic time, uh, but it's happening. Since May the 1st, my first official day as your senior pastor and head of staff, I have met one-on-one -on -one over Zoom or by phone with all nine staff members, with 27 individual elders and church members, with 18 committees or other groups, with three presbytery level groups. And I look forward to more calls and more conversations in the days to come. But the truth is, while you have called me to be your senior pastor, we don't really know each other yet. And so I have remained largely silent but that silence is beginning to feel like a betrayal. I want to speak into this moment in the life of our nation, a moment into which the church is also invited to speak. The main reason why I am compelled to speak, Elijah. My education about the depth of racial inequality in America and the process of my unlearning my choosing to actively engage my own participation in systems of privilege and white supremacy began shortly before Elijah was born, when I found myself considering, what does it mean to parent a black boy who will become a black man in America in the 21st century? Suddenly, what I had vaguely been aware of through well-intentioned social studies and history lessons and what had come into my public consciousness a few years prior with the birth of the movement for black lives in Ferguson, Missouri was coming into my family. And while before, as a white woman, I had the privilege of looking away, now I no longer do. So I began doing some serious education and self-reflection, and I've come to a point where I openly acknowledge and confess the sin of my own racism and the ways I participate in racist systems that are woven into the fabric of our nation, not to mention the fabric of the church. This was the only way I could attempt to faithfully parent this black child, my black child to learn how to see him so I can protect him, so I can equip him to see himself with God's eyes, to take pride in his race, his identity, his appearance, his culture, and so I can join in the call to justice to do the same for all. It, um, it feels so selfish and shameful to confess that this is how I got here that it took the addition of someone in my own family to open my eyes to the brutal oppression of an entire race of people. But that is what it took. And so I am, conspelled, I am compelled to speak. As our city and so many others burn before our eyes, I am compelled to speak as a parent, to speak and to act for my son, for other sons, whose black lives matter deeply. I am compelled as well to speak and to act as a Christian. Racism and racial inequality isn't a partisan issue. It's a spiritual issue. We Christians are called to join in God's justice and respond to the needs of the vulnerable, the marginalized, and the oppressed. 
Uh, this, this is my Bible. It's been used inappropriately throughout history to condone slavery, sexism, discrimination, horrific abuses of power and human rights. And it is still being used inappropriately today. It's being used to divide, to tear down, to keep out, rather than to include, to welcome, to unite in justice and mercy. And that call to justice and mercy is found all throughout this Bible, all throughout our sacred scriptures. Here are just a few. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. That's Isaiah 117. From Micah 6, 8, God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? From Psalm 82, give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. From Proverbs 31, speak out for those who cannot speak for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. From Matthew 7, Jesus says, in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. In James, we hear, faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Amos 5, the prophet says, speaking on behalf of God, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And Jesus says in Luke 11, talking to the Pharisees, woe to you, for you tithe mint and rue and herbs of all kinds and neglect justice and the love of God. It is these you ought to have practiced. The call to justice is all throughout scripture. When faced with the evil of systemic racism and the cries for justice in our streets, as a Christian, I am compelled to speak out, to name what is evil, and to work for what is just. And as your senior pastor, I am compelled to speak. One of my favorite stories in scripture is when Jesus first begins his public ministry in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it's Luke chapter four, and it says this, uh, when Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom, he stood up to read doesn't that always happen, right? People go away and then they come back to their home church and they're asked to read and worship to participate. So Jesus stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The Lord has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is Jesus' mission statement, his vision for his ministry and articulation of what he is called to do on earth, to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free. It is this work into which he invites all who would follow him. As your new senior pastor, naturally I checked out your website. Actually I did this in the, uh, the interview process before you had even called me. I was interested in your mission statement. What does Pleasant Hill Presbyterian Church stand for? and plan to be about in the world. I quickly discovered your tagline, connecting faith to everyday life, and I loved it. I love it. I resonate. Uh, that, it, it resonates with me, um, and I strive to live this daily as I lead you. And I also found this. 
your mission and vision. This is from PleasantHillPC.org. At Pleasant Hill Presbyterian Church, we affirm that we are all loved by God beyond our wildest imagination. We belong to God who frees us to live God's love instead of judgment. We unabashedly follow Jesus without denying other paths God may have provided. God calls us to treat and welcome everyone as God's beloved, regardless of age, race, culture, gender, religion, or sexual orientation. Our worship is both creative and traditional. We listen attentively for God through prayer, scripture, and God's present activity in the world. We seek ways to stand with the broken and the oppressed by rolling up our sleeves and getting personally involved. We're a relationship-based church and we strive to be good neighbors who connect faith with everyday life. It's good. When I read this, I see who you strive to be as a congregation, and I wanted to be a part of that. And now I am a part of that, and so I point you to this mission, this vision, as together we claim the love of God for everyone, the image of God in everyone, and the justice of God for all, which means paying attention to those in need of justice, to those who are broken and oppressed. It means rolling up our sleeves, howsoever that may look for you. If this is the beginning of your awareness of racial injustice and the violence faced by black Americans, and you are feeling overwhelmed, I would love to hear from you. I would love to learn your story, to share more of mine, and share some incredibly helpful uh, books, essays, other resources that have helped me personally with learning and unlearning. So please email me, call me, or text me, and we will set a time to talk. I'm available to you all, regardless of where you are on your journey of faith, or on your journey of racial identity, or on your journey of how your faith and identity may be calling you to learn something new in this moment, or if you are simply overwhelmed by everything happening right now. I'm here for you. And tomorrow, um, I invite you, along with my colleagues, pastors Jody and Jenny, uh, to a prayer service of lament on Zoom. It'll be a time to lift prayers for all who are aching, grieving, protesting, raging, prayers for our nation and its leaders, prayers of personal grief or anger or sadness. So look for an email with more details for that lament service on Zoom. Uh, it's tomorrow night at seven o'clock and uh, those details will be posted in our PHPC forum here on Facebook as well. Friends, I am grateful to get to know you, to share myself, and my family with you. I didn't know that I was being called into leadership in a time of pandemic. <laughs> I didn't know I was being called to leadership in a time of unfolding racial turmoil and incredibly public suffering and grieving. And you didn't know that you were calling me to lead you to serve you in these unprecedented times, as everyone says, either but we have been called together, perhaps for just such a time as this, to quote the book of Esther. I look forward to leading and serving and speaking together. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you all tonight, and may you know the abiding presence of the Spirit and the deep love of God for us all. Amen.